Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Make Our World Your Runway. You know this is the show that always interviews the most fascinating individuals from the world of beauty, pageantry, fashion, modeling, business, and even the entertainment industry. And of course, we always have an exciting guest every week. But before we bring our guest on, we definitely like to give you some announcements so that we can make sure that you're tuned in to watch all the shows from Make Our World Your Runway and Success Stories. And to do that, I highly recommend that you do subscribe to the Global Trade Chamber YouTube channel so that when we come on YouTube, you can see all of our shows and also success stories, which is produced by the Global Trade Chamber. Now, the reason why I'm telling you to watch success stories, because it is absolutely amazing. They have some fabulous women on there that their stories are just excellent. They have come from humble beginnings and have taken themselves up to be some of the world's greatest entrepreneurs businesswomen, and have done some wonderful things in community service. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, please subscribe to the Global Trade Chamber YouTube channel so that you can view success stories and also make our world your runway. And volume two of the 100 Most Successful Women in Business book is now available on Amazon. We launched this book in London, England last year. And again, if you are a businesswoman, you are definitely going to want to pick up a copy of this book. Once again, these women really come from humble beginnings, tell their stories, and they have gone on to be world-renowned entrepreneurs and, again, doing wonderful things in community service. So you can always go to the website at www.100swb.com for all the details on Volume 2 of the 100 Most Successful Women in Business book. And stay tuned because Volume 3 will be launching very, very shortly. And if you are a successful woman, you will definitely want to get in this book. Why not tell your story and have it read from the most exciting individuals from around the world? And then, of course, get ready for some amazing business expos. Coming up October 1st, 100 Successful Women and the Global Trade Chamber will be in Dallas, Texas, a show you do not want to miss. And, of course, America's number one international trade conference is coming up where? In Puerto Rico. That is going to come up October 25th to the 29th. If you want to attend this show, I'm telling you, book your tickets now. From what I understand, it's starting to be a sellout. I've done many shows in Puerto Rico. The world loves going there. It's a beautiful island. Definitely get your tickets. Once again, if you need information, go to the website www.100swb.com for all the information. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as we like to say, lights, camera, action, it's Make Our World Your Runway. And today we have a fabulous guest. She's a 23-year-old 23 year old college student from Lima, Peru, and she inspires to become an American Sign Language interpreter. Very interesting. She's also an active member in her community. She is on the board of directors of the Teen Edge and is the co-founder of I Hate Pity, where she teaches people to break all the stigma associated with having a disability. And she currently holds the title, and we're so proud of her on this, as Miss Achievement Florida 2023. She placed second runner-up in Miss America Achievement USA. And some may consider her multi, multilingual. Multilingual. She speaks English, Spanish, and studying American Sign Language. She also holds some conversations in French, so you can definitely say she is multi bilingual. And her goal in life is to impact and motivate people on a daily basis so that together we can make a difference in the world, breaking one stigma at a time. Those are fabulous words. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome my guest. Valentina Montenegro to make our world your runway. Welcome, Valentina. Hello there, Valentina. How are you? Hi, Angela. I'm so good. How are you? I'm great. Boy, I'll tell you, you have some bio and congratulations on uh, Miss Achievement uh, of Florida, and also being the second runner-up in Miss Achievement USA. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Yeah, no, that was great. How was that pageant? It looked very interesting. I was starting to watch some of it. It it was so so much fun. It was actually my very first pageant, so I was very surprised with the outcome. 
Yeah, I, no, I mean, you you did a, a, a great job with that. I mean, it was absolutely excellent. I mean, and just the fact that you became the second runner up, I mean, uh, you know, that, that's a great achievement in itself. Thank you. Yeah, I went in just expecting to put my best foot forward and give I Hate Pity the voice that it needed. And it came out more than I expected. So I'm very happy with that. Well, that's the way it is sometimes when you go into these competitions. You do want to put your best foot forward. But if you certainly just kind of relax and enjoy it, you'd be surprised that uh, the results are, are, are usually better than you've expected. You know, I've done a lot of that in competitions with music. And I've gone in there and always said to myself, you know what? I'm just going to come here to have a great time. and don't expect to win. And to my surprise, sometimes I did win a couple of competitions. So you're right. You put your best foot forward and always hope for the best. But anyway, you do a lot of other great things. I mean, uh, just the fact that you, uh, the I hate pity, uh, you want to teach people to deal with handicaps and uh, put their best foot forward there. So how do you actually achieve that? Because that is amazing, an amazing accomplishment. Yeah, so it's actually... A very funny story thinking back, and I'm tr going to try to encapsulate it in, within a couple of minutes. But the way I hit Pity started is uh, by our lovely friend Hunter Ray. She was actually the one behind this idea, who I'm going to try to reenact this word for word, gave me a call while I was waiting for my um, second college class to start and was like, hey, I have an idea. I need your help. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Can I get some background information, please? Because as of right now, I have no clue what you're talking about. She was like, I want you to help me start a campaign that will help people know that the disabilities, and I use the word disabilities lightly because if you know me, which I think you pretty much know me well by now, I hate the word disability. To me, it just sounds so limiting, so I changed it to the word condition. So she was like, I want you to ultimately help me um, change people's idea of the word disability and take it from a negative to a positive. Right, exactly. And you know, it's so funny that you should say that because I went to uh, my cardiologist uh, uh, about a month ago and <laughs> I always say, I don't have high blood pressure, but when I go to that office and they take my blood pressure, it's up there because I always get scared going to that office. I'm always going to afraid he's, he's going to tell me, oh, we got to have another surgery. We got to do this. We got to do that. But luckily, I keep my fingers crossed. Everything is has been good so far. And since I had my stents put in back in 2007, but he said the exact same thing to me. He said, what is your secret? And I didn't know what he meant. And he said, well, with the condition that you have, he said, you keep going. He said, a lot of people that have had your condition and have even had heart surgery like yourself, he said, just have not seemed to come back. He said, so I'm trying to find out what you do. He said, so maybe I can tell this to some of my other patients. I said, well, first of all, I said, I know I have this condition. I know what the good points are. I know what, the, you know, what my danger zones are. I've learned how to live with it. I've been on certain medication. I've had stents put in an artery, which have kept me going since 2007. I said, I just put my best foot forward, get up every day and don't dwell on it. And just go about life the way everybody else does. I said, that's my secret. I said, that's the only thing I can tell you. And I said, I, I don't have pity on myself. I said, yes. I said, I was very young when I suffered a, a massive heart attack. I said, but I don't think about it. I said, you know what? It was a fact of life. It was something that happened. Uh, exactly. my, my whole family had heart conditions. So that was kind of hereditary. Mm -hmm. I said, but that's my secret. I just keep going. I get up and I try to empower others. and. That's basically it. I said, just put my two feet on the ground and keep running like Bugs Bunny. So he laughed. And he said, no, that's good. He said, because I'm going to tell my, a, lot of, a lot of my patients that. So I'm like you. I don't call it a handicap. I call it a condition. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there, and there you go. But you've done wonders, whatever your condition is. You've done fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, as I said, I like to call it condition just because the word disability, and by my at least, has... It sounds so limiting. And to me, in my book, I have no limits. The only limits are, are the ones that you put on yourself. And to me, I have no limits. So I just, I'm like, I'm going to throw that word out the window. And that's amazing. I say the same thing. I don't have any limits. You know, even during COVID, when I had to be very careful because of, you know, having a heart condition, 
but I knew, you know, what the situation was. And I, I, I knew what my limits were. I knew what I could do. Once the vaccines came out, I was, uh, I was probably like one of the first people online because my thing was, I want to live. Okay. And, you know, I think I said, if I could get myself through that and live through that, I always feel like, gosh, I could accomplish anything. So, uh, you know, I get up on in the morning and try to smile and laugh. And I always say there's people that have a more serious condition than I do. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you have to look at things that way, but, uh, you have to just keep going and you're a great role model for people. It's the key. I mean, I could, and I'm going to tell you this just because it's normally what I've been doing all my life. It's you have to smile. No, you could, I could be having the worst day ever and still have a smile on my face. People are like, why are you smiling? Because I have to, like, there's no other way for me to go about it. Like I, I don't know if I told you this, but I think I did share with you. I'm going to share again, just so the viewers know. I, I'm someone who was only given 24 hours to live. Yet here I am almost 24 years later. So thank you. Thank you. Exactly. I was given 30, 30 minutes to live. Okay. And I I remember saying to the doctor, I said, 30 minutes. I said, okay, I'll tell you what, you do your job. I'll do my job. If you can fix what's wrong, (laughs) we're not talking 30 minutes. We're talking 30 years more. Exactly. Like you said, and here I am. Okay. You know, when they tell you that, uh, and and it's funny because my reaction to that was the doctor thought I was going to cry. I said, no. I said, fate is what it is. I said, but I'm sure we're going to get past that 30 minutes. And sure enough, they did. So yeah, even in even in something like that, you have to keep positive. You have to say to yourself, all right, I'm here now. Am I going to get past that 30 minutes? Or where am I going to be tomorrow? Where am I going to be, you know, the end of the day? So. Exactly. Life can throw you a curveball, but if you can hit that curveball and go around the bases and score a home run, that's all you need to know. Yeah. Yeah. So another a fantastic thing that you do, I know you have the uh, I Hate Kitty, which is a great organization. I know Hunter and Landon have definitely been involved with that. But you do a lot with dogs. Now, is this service dogs or because some of those animals you train are beautiful? Yeah, it's actually very funny. The training that I went to was for the specific organization or in Orlando that helps kids or adults um, get service dogs. So I just got back two weeks ago. I just got back and I now have my service dog with me who is now currently on my floor taking a nap. (laughs) (laughs) That's cute. That's a, that's a trouble. You know, it's so funny. I'm surprised that my cat not on the back of my chair. Okay, normally I'll, I'll, I'm in the studio, but today I'm doing it from home. And she loves to get in on the act, all right? And I will tell you one thing. My cat is almost like therapy. When I get a migraine headache, if she gets on my head at night and sleeps like right here, that headache goes away because she purrs and purrs and purrs. And there's something in the purr that's r- really amazing. I even spoke to the doctor about that, and they said, yes. They said they have seen that happen. They said in people that have been in hospice, if they bring like a dog or a cat or a cat jumps on the bed and a cat purrs, it seems to bring up the spirits, okay? Yeah, it it really does help because even therapy dogs, I'm going to bring myself back to the time where I was in and out of hospitals for my different surgeries. I used to get visited when I was at Shriners by therapy dogs that the people would bring in, which they would basically just put them there and we could like pet them, play around with them for a good five to ten minutes. And that would just, even if we were going through the worst pain, that would take it away for about five seconds because we were focusing on a dog that was right in front of us, just acting cute and trying to make us feel better. Exactly. Yeah, I, I've noticed that. In fact, uh, my cat, every now and then I'll put the earplugs, I'll put them up like this, okay? And she <laughs> gets right into what she wants. I mean, I have two cats, but the one just gets into everything, Okay. Uh, no matter what I do, okay, uh, if, if when I walk out the door, she's got to follow me to the door. When I, She knows when I'm coming in the door because she's right there, all right? Uh, if I'm on the phone and she tries to get in in my conversations, if I'm sitting at the dining room table, she jumps up on my lap, she's trying to eat with me. So I, I, oh, I call her my therapy cat because she really is. And there's times where if I'm very tired or I've had a long day, it's been a rough day. She's she's my therapy, you know. I'd say, okay, Jada, come on, let's go, let's go talk. And she'll sit right next to me and is almost if she knows 
what I'm talking about. Okay. Because mm-hmm. I guess certain words that I've said to her, she's picked up the sounds. Yeah. And she, she'll, yeah. Okay. And it's almost like she understands exactly what I'm saying. Animals have a crazy mind. They Animals do. Have a crazy mind because my service dog, the one that I have now, is actually my second, my first service dog, but my second um, lab that I've had my entire life. And he, on top of the fact that he is the exact resemblance of my first lab, only difference is she was a girl and he's a boy. He, it's like he literally reads my mind. Like the other day, I was having a bad day and I was just in my room trying to cool off, trying to not think about the bad day. And he just came right in my lap and was like, okay, you want to de stress? Here, pet me. <laughs> so I did that for a good 30 minutes and then he just helped me feel better. Yeah, no, that's, and they do that. Animals will do that. Like I said, this morning I was talking to the cat and she'll actually come in if I'm doing my hair. I'll put makeup on. And it was so funny because we didn't know that she was a Bombay. And a Bombay is a highly, highly intelligent cat. Right. And even the veterinarian said to me, she's no, they're almost like humans. She says their brain is unbelievable. She said, if you talk to her long enough, she will actually understand what you're saying. And if I say to her, come on, let's go. She'll follow me right in. So yeah. no matter where I'm going. So she uh, she's picked up sounds, but I think she understands words and when she starts talking it's almost if she she does want to talk back and almost want to talk back in our language the other day i said to her i said okay i said jade if i win the lottery i said buy a big house i said and you and i just you and i gonna live it and she started to rattle on (laughs) she understood Okay, yeah, that's fine with me. I love it. You know, I'll have my own room or whatever. So, yeah, yeah it's true. Animals really are, uh, they're amazing. But another thing about you, so, you know, you've started this organization. You do train animals, but you're also multi-bilingual. I mean, you speak English, Spanish, and you have conversations in French. Yeah. Well, going back to the animal situation i don't actually train the animals when i got north he was already trained so he's okay. trained stuff like if i drop let's say my phone to the floor he can pick it up if i need a door to be if a door is halfway open and i need it to be fully open he can push the door open um oh, geez. accessibility push plates if i go out somewhere and there's an accessibility button and i can give him a command and he'll push the button so the door can open he can Turn on and off lights for me. It's it's crazy. Yeah, and, and you and you're gonna laugh when you say that with Jada. If the door is closed, she will actually reach up with a paw and try to turn that handle and open the door. I looked at her one day. I said, "Wait a minute, I said, this isn't a cat. I think this is a human in a cat's body." Because what cat is gonna do that? Yeah, she yeah. actually got up on her hind legs. She turned that knob. And she got it to open, and she pushed open that door. I said, I said she's done that from watching me. I said, I looked at her the other day. I said, what's the next thing you're going to do? Take a knife and a fork and eat like that? I said, you know. But, yeah, she has done that. If I drop something, she'll kind of push it to where I am. All right? Uh, very amazing. Uh, so you're right. Animals, they do. They You don't know what's in their mind. But they do give unconditional love. I would I will say that. And if they know you're stressed out or something is wrong, they will definitely try and help out if they've been with you long enough. Yeah. So, and I tell people I'm an animal lover. I was just telling someone the other day, if I knew an alligator was friendly, I'd probably adopt it as a pet. <laughs> but you know, there was one time, this is a funny story. When I was living in Coral Springs and I did have a very big home back then with a big picture window in the back, big bay, sliding glass doors, I should say. And the baby alligator kind of got lost. Uh, we lived near a lake and it came down the street. And I'll never forget the neighbor saying, well, if the baby is here, how far away can the mother be? Oh, no. Well, it came the mother down the street. Oh, no. You never, you never saw anybody run over two garbage cans real fast like me. Okay. Oh, God. And I got in the house, locked the door. All of a sudden, looking out my, where my big windows were, there's sliding glass doors. There's the mother sitting by my dining room glass doors. And evidently, because I had actually, where the baby was, I actually threw some food and a little toy 
And mm-hmm. I mean, it, this, this was a real baby alligator. It, it wouldn't have even bothered anybody. The mother must have sent something because she sat there all day. And before she left, she actually took, you know, they have those little funny little paws. She actually put it up against my glass as if to say thank you. And then she left. Oh, God. Wow. So even an alligator, even an alligator has a mind that's if to say, you know what? You know we, we could bite our head you bite your head off, okay? However, okay, you help my little baby. And she left with the baby, went down the street, we never saw them again. Wow. That's yeah. Well, it's, it, exactly. I mean, they're dangerous, but you know, even them, if they sense that you're you're trying to to help them. Uh my cousin had an experience where it was a little baby bear got into his backyard. Okay, he lives on a ranch and it got stuck and he helped this little baby bear. All of a sudden, up from come up from behind him, the mother bear hugging him as if say, Thank you so much. Was trying to was hugging him, kissing him. And all he said to me was, All I saw was those claws on my shoulder. But the mother bear, (laughs) she saw that he wouldn't hurt the baby bear and that he was helping the baby bear. So, and it is incredible. Animals do, they have a uh, it's an unbelievable mind. People don't think that, that they have a mind like that, but they certainly do. Oh, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. They know what they're doing. So with all these things that you do, I mean, you're like a superwoman. I mean, oh my what God. what what else fills up your day? Because it looks like you're, you're like me. It seems like you go from one thing right to the next. Well, I mean, answering your question about languages, my... um. My first language being that that's where I was from is actually Spanish because I'm from Peru. So that's where I got my Spanish from. I learned English, believe it or not, by watching TV when I moved over here when I was four years old. And then um, American Sign Language is actually my major. It's what I'm majoring in right now in college. So that's where that comes from. And then the French, I had to take two years of French or any other language to be able to graduate high school. I picked French. And so that's where the conversational French comes in. Uh, I knew I I knew that had to come in somewhere. In fact, it's funny because my husband speaks French. All right. He's not as fluent as he used to be, but he can still carry a conversation. And how he learned it was he was in the service. And Mm -hmm. first he was stationed in Belgium and they do speak French there. And then he was stationed in Paris for two years. And he loved Paris. I mean, he still talks about Paris. <laughs> and that's where he learned the language. And then when he went to work in New York City, uh, at first he worked for MTI, the telecommunications company. And when they knew that he could understand French and he spoke it, they gave him all the French accounts. He got all the French <laughs> banks, all the French restaurants. So they gave him. And he really, I mean, at one time, I used to say to him, are you going to say it in English? Because he would forget and he would just. Yeah. And just go. French. French. Yeah. yeah. So when um, when he kind of left the telecommunications industry back in the early 2000s, you know, uh, he wasn't speaking it that much on a daily basis, but he can still hold a conversation with someone. I mean, I, if someone starts speaking French. Oh, yeah. He'll speak back to them. And yeah. yeah. And if he can't say something back, he totally understands what they're saying. I mean, he can uh, understand the people of Haiti because they, they there's a little yeah. French there. Yeah. 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 So when we go into a French restaurant and they come up to the table and most people don't speak French, he does. Oh, I think everything is more delicious than what it's supposed to be because, you know, he starts talking to the waiters and he orders in French. So when we go in a French restaurant, I say, I'm not ordering. You do that. <laughs> you know the language. Okay. You know the language, not me. Exactly. And here's a running joke. I always say, it's the only Italian that doesn't speak that much Italian, okay, but fluent in French, okay? Because you look at my last name, it's Basilico, you know, right away, that's that's totally Italian from Italy. And then you look at my husband saying, well, there's no Italian coming out of that, but there's a lot of French coming out of that. So, And what most people don't realize in certain parts of Italy, the language is mixed because if you go up to the way up to the northern part of Italy, it's on the borderline of France. Okay. So there's that French Italian in there. 
So some parts, if you really listen to my husband, he speaks Parisian, which they speak right in Paris. But there is a little bit of Italian in there as well, too. So, uh, and my father's real mother, she was from a, a town called Montreal, which is on the borderline of the French Alps. So uh, if you look at my father's real mother, you didn't think she was Italian at all. She actually, You actually thought she was French, blue oh, eyes. Wow. Very fair skin. That's where I get that very fair skin from because of that part of, of Italy. Now, here's a funny thing about the Italian language. You go down to Sicily, forget it. They have no idea what you're saying. Oh, no. Two different dialects in Italy. Yeah, okay. Uh, if you go, If you go to Sicily and you speak Italian to them, their dialect is totally, totally different, okay? I'll give you an example. In Italian, the turtle is called the tortuga, all right? Yeah, just like it's Spanish. Right, same thing. And tortilla is like a cake. Now you go down to Sicily, the tortuga is something that they eat. It's not the turtle, okay? I don't even know what they So, oh, all, God. yeah, the language is altogether different. Yeah, I don't know what they speak. Well, you speak a combination down there because many, many years uh, when the Romans were around, the, the Moors came in and it was a combination of languages. So mm -hmm. that's why it's gotten better throughout the years, but you still have to go down there and know what they're saying. <laughs> so, I can understand. So. I feel like that sometimes because I have half of my, this is going to be a really funny story. I have a very distinguished group of friends. Like It's like half of my friends are Puerto Rican, half of them are Arabic. So I can, I know bits and pieces of Arabic, not enough to hold a conversation, but if they say a couple of words, I can, if I pinpoint and choose, I can try to pick out what they're saying. But for half of it, I'm like, okay, break it down. I don't, I'm going to need you to speak slowly because I have no idea what you're, what you're saying right now. Exactly. And I'll, and I'll, Give you for instance, most people don't know this. I'm half Italian and half Arabic because when they traced our family tree, they found out we go way back to the Egyptians and uh, Nefertiti, Cleopatra. So when I was in Greece, going back oh, 1999, I was in Greece and uh, I went to the Palace of Mykonos. Mm -hmm. and I went into the museum and all of a sudden, all these tour guides and the people running the store, they're saying, Nefertiti, Nefertiti. Now, in the museum there, there is a bust of Nefertiti. Okay. It's supposed to be my profile. And I'm wondering, what in the heck are they talking about? And they're pointing to me. So my husband said to me, he said, look up. I said, oh, no. I said, it's the bust they of Nefertiti. They think you were her. Oh, no. <laughs> they, think, they think I was this reincarnated princess. So here, KPM TV decides in Greece they're going to interview me. Okay, I said, I don't believe this. I said, this was crazy. So I had to go on television in there, and they swear that I am reincarnated. They're asking me about all the gold I was buried with. I said, wait a minute. I said, how can I be buried? I'm still here. Well, you were reincarnated. I said, yeah, well, yeah. I said, show me the grave because I don't have any of the gold. I said, that's for sure. And but yeah. they, really, they really believed that I was reincarnated because if you really look, and there's only – one bust of her in the world it, it is a little frightening because when i looked at it i said geez that does look like my profile but oh, the funniest geez. thing was when the famed archaeologist from egypt came in because the year i was with the winterfest boat parade and they did jewel on the nile they brought in this very famous archaeologist who's always on television he comes in and he looks at me and he says nefertiti and i said oh no not oh, you God. he says yeah, he said, I swear to God. He said, you he said, I think you're reincarnated. I said, Yeah, you know, like the third person or the one hundred and third person that's told me this. I said, Oh no. I said it's getting it's getting I said it's kind of getting scary. But then they recreated a few years ago when it was in New York and they brought all that back. What Nefertiti was really supposed to look like they and you know, of course they could do that with uh, the artificial intelligence and the computer graphics, all that. Well, when it went on ABC, my phone went off the wall that day because everybody thought it was me. Somebody said, did you pose for that picture? I said, no. I said, I didn't. I said, I just have some roots going back to the days, I said, of Egypt. 
I said, but but it is it is scary because when you see pictures in Nefertiti and I really start looking at it, I said, oh no, that does look like me. I said, well, maybe there's some truth in the matter. Yes. <laughs> so oh. you're right about that. Well, you, you're you're just like me. You meet people that do speak different languages or from different cultures, and somehow or another, we can interact with them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. but yeah, no, but I think all the things that you're doing is is great. So with I Hate Pity, what exactly do you do with that? Okay, so with I Hate Pity, I Hate Pity is basically, we're trying to get it to a point where it launches to like different parts of the world, hopefully at some point. But due to COVID, um, yeah. COVID changed a lot of things. So we had to like rearrange our stuff. And right now we're just on Instagram and Facebook, by the way. I want to thank you for being a part of our community. Oh, yeah. no, my pleasure. I thought, I thought it was a great organization. Yeah, I love the work that... Uh, you know, Hunter and Amanda have been doing with you. Yes. So basically what we're doing right now is just day by day posting one or a couple of different videos of different conditions just so people could see, hey, this is what it's like to be in my shoes if you have blah, blah, blah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that that's very true because there's a lot of people out there that don't know about these organizations, okay? And it could be from young people to middle-aged people to even senior citizens that have never had these organizations. So what you're doing is great and you're giving a lot of people hope because like you uh, said in your bio, you know, uh, breaking one stigma at a time, okay? So you're breaking the barrier. So people with conditions, you're teaching them how to live, how to go uh, forward. And, you know, um, I don't know if you ever were involved with them, but I always watched that documentary on Triners. Yes. And yes. I love what they have done with children there. I mean, it's amazing how they've taken children that couldn't walk or couldn't talk yes. and have brought them right to be a normal children again. Angela, trust me, if I even began to tell you that I wouldn't even be where I am medically wise, if it wasn't for them, I would be lying to you. Because wow. and I I'm gonna tell you this just so you're informed. I, they actually had to close their doors, I believe, two years ago, and that crushed my soul. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know they I crushed was like, oh my god, it's a COVID probably. I was like, no, what is I, a million things were going through my head. I was like, this place cannot close. No. Like this place. It's not only meant to help me, it's meant to help so many other people like it has been. It cannot close its doors. No, it can't close its doors. I mean, they have helped so many children. I mean, it's it's unbelievable between them and even St. Jude's with the, the children that have cancer. But, I mean, Shriners, I mean, I've watched these kids. I mean, the, that one little boy I love one with the bow tie and he says I've had 18 surgeries and he was a little guy and how they got him walking now and I love when he comes up with the blanket and he says if I can do it you can do it I mean mm -hmm. it's just amazing what made them close was it COVID or was it lack of funds or I have no idea I know that other shiners around the world are still open but as far as the Tepa would they had to close their doors believe me Angela I was getting off work that day and so first thing I saw when I opened up my social media, Shriners possibly closing the stores. When I told you that I called my mom and I was like, do you know that this is happening? She was like, no. Why are they closing? What is? And I was like, I don't know. But I know those people are going to find good jobs because they have multitudes of experience. And I know yes. that people, are still gonna, people and kids are still going to be getting the help that they need because there's no possible way it can be gone forever. Yeah, oh, exactly. I know. Like I said, Trinus is just amazing. Every time they're on, I'll watch that full commercial or I'll watch, a, I'll watch a documentary on them. I've even donated to their hospital. I mean, they're they're great. I mean, and the people that work with, uh, you know, the children or even adults or whatever, it's amazing work that they do. I mean, I just, uh, and the patients that they have, and they always have a smile on their face, which is so important. Yes, they have. They have actually been a huge part of where, what Girls Camp was too, because I believe Hunter told you this, but I'm going to reenact just so the viewers know. We hosted Girls Camp for us uh, several years at Shriders. Um, uh -huh. We were able to do it in 
one of the little, I guess, private halls that they had. We hosted it there for years. We used the fish in the area that they called the fishbowl as well, where they did activities for the kids. And that was where we would help the girls with their makeovers and photo shoots and all that stuff. They So when it comes to that part, they even contributed to our What Is I Hate Pity Now? Wow, that's a no, that's amazing. I know Hunter had told me something about it, but of course you gave it a little more in depth. And that is absolutely amazing. And you're right, a place like Triners cannot close. All right. Uh that has to be that has to go on because there's so many people that really need their services and they do unbelievable work. Like you just said, you wouldn't be what you're doing today if it wasn't for them. And, uh, you know, I've gone through therapy myself, especially when I had my hip operated on. I even went through some therapy when I had my heart attack. And it's unbelievable what therapists do. I saw it with my father, okay? Uh, my father, many, many years ago, unfortunately, he's not with us now, but he had a massive blood clot that hit the left side of his brain and it lifted and pushed his brain. He oh, removed no. it. The doctor did not know if he was ever going to come back. OK, um, he said he might come back partially, He's, but I don't know about fully. Well, the therapist that worked with my dad, OK, because he had to learn how to walk, talk, do everything all over again. Within one year, one solid year, this man was back to just about 100 percent normal. And it was because of the work of the therapist. And I still remember uh, at Christmas time, some of them that are still in that industry, I still send them a card. I call them up because they're the heroes. Okay. Uh, they, they stay there and work with a person. And I mean, especially when you're working with the brain and my dad didn't understand that he would cry. Uh, he would almost go back to like being a, a child, but in the one solid year I was, he was driving the car. I couldn't believe it. So I have to applaud every therapist out there. Applaud yourself. Applaud Shriners. I mean, even the people at St. Jude's, what they do with children with cancer is amazing. So, um, yeah, I'm totally, totally amazed by all of this. So anyway, my dear, with all the things that you do, uh, before we close, what are your plans for the future? What do you foresee yourself doing? So ultimately, we just want to hopefully get I Hate Pity off the ground. And by off the ground, I mean something other than social media. We want to hopefully get it on TV, on um, the news, on the radio, on stuff like that, just so more people can know what we're trying to do and know that uh, disability, I use air quotes again because that word is, is irrelevant to me. A condition, but yeah. Disability isn't a reason for you to stop. That is the main reason. And I'm going to give a quick backstory of how we came up with the name I Hate Pity because we were actually, I think we wouldn't call it something else at some point. I think we were going to call it In My Shoes. But when I was on the phone with Hunter and we were trying to still um, figure out how we were going to enlarge this idea, she was like, well, what is one thing that you would say you don't like what people encounter you when it comes to your CP. And I said, well, I hate pity. And she was like, oh. and I'm like, what is going on? What just happened? She was like, you said it. And I'm like, said what? The truth? I, I hate pity. Yeah. I mean, and here we are with I hate pity. So Ex Exactly. And you know what? Sometimes people want to hear the truth. And sometimes people that don't want to hear the truth are afraid of the truth. I have found that out. Okay. And the truth is something you have to have to almost deal with on a daily basis. It's sometimes it can be hard, but like you say, things that you've done and, and, and the Triners, it, it keeps people going and it gives people hope and, and we just continue on. So do you think you'll do any more pageants by the way? That is definitely still in the question. I don't know if it's going to continue for me with uh, pageant stuff only because I do have school and I have my job as yeah. well. But Miss Achievement World slash USA has been one of the greatest things I've actually ever stepped out of my comfort zone to do, which had it not been for Hunter and for another one of my uh, pageant sisters slash friends that is a part of I Hate Pity as well, I wouldn't have stepped in to doing um Miss right. because I'm gonna be truthful. I know nothing about pageants. 
I know nothing about pageants. So, and the little that I do know is precisely because of watching Hunter and watching everything that she has done, basically in all the 13 years that I've known her. Yes. But I never pictured myself, me just being me, I never pictured myself actually going into doing a pageant. So as the more and more I got motivated, I was like, okay, I'm going to do it, let alone, did I ever picture making uh, the top three let alone second round up. So I'm just going to continue to do what I've been doing with the crown, which is continue to show people that it's not on the top of your head. It's in right. your head. It's so, in your heart. That's what I tell my girls every day. You can wear that crown on your head, but you have to wear that crown in your heart. Exactly. And what you just said, you've been a, that's a great motivation for everyone. In fact, you know, I was watching one of the big pageants, uh, that took place out in, uh, I believe it was out in California. There was a girl that came on stage. Now, she, of course, she knew she knew she wouldn't win, but I, I think she got something. She didn't have any legs, but she came out and danced. Okay, I mean, she had. I think she had part of her legs. She came out and danced with everybody else and did the choreography. I said, "Oh my God, this is amazing!" So, what you've done, you've taken the next step, and you've you've done a pageant. Yes, I have to. I have to say, Hunter is absolutely amazing. Okay, uh, if you watch Hunter, no matter what she does, and now she's coaching Landon, and she's helped you get into this, uh, in, into this pageant. That's great. And you said a mouthful. We wear the crown on our head, but you got to wear the crown here, and you got to wear it. Like people say, Christmas is in your heart. That crown is in your heart, and you can wear it for life. And even if you don't compete, it's something that you've done. You've shown other people that with a condition, yes, they can do these things. Okay. Uh, why stop? You know, this, this is motivating, but anyway, my dear, I want to thank you for taking time because I know you have a busy schedule and you do a lot. So I want to thank you for being on make our world your runway. And mm -hmm. at any time, Oh, thank you, sweetie. And at any time that you want to come back, you have an open door to come back on the show. And I do want to tell you from my heart and everybody from my organization, keep going, keep doing what you're doing. You are a great inspiration to not only myself and all the pageant people, but you're a great inspiration to people around the world. So I want to wish you a great weekend. And like I said, if you ever want to come back to the show, you have an open door. Thank you. I appreciate it. You have a great day. All right, Dan, you have a great weekend. We have a long weekend coming up, so get some rest. And we look forward to seeing you in the very near future. I'm going to try. Bye. Take care. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen, another fabulous guest. Was she absolutely amazing? A woman that has a condition and has done so many things, started a charity organization, has been involved with Shriners, works with service animals, and even went out and won that pageant. I am just so impressed. But ladies and gentlemen, we do want to wish you a wonderful weekend. It is a long weekend. So we hope everyone has a great time with family and friends. And remember, subscribe to the Global Trade Chamber YouTube channel so that you can see all the shows from Make Our World Your Runway. So thank you again for watching, and we will see you next week with another fabulous guest.